Great job, guys. That was wonderful. Wow, I just uh, really appreciate that from our youth choir, guys. That was well done. And I think this is the first time I've ever preached a sermon where there's people sitting behind me as well as in front of me. So, you know what? Uh, Andrews University Church, uh, Pastor Dwight Nelson does that all the time. There's like an entire church behind him and in front of him, and I'm like, wow, that seems interesting, and now I'm kind of there too. So, but guys, thank you so much for all of your talents and sharing them with us. Beautiful song. I just love those words, fall afresh on us, stay with us, spirit of the living God. What a beautiful, beautiful way to start our service here today, and looking forward to hearing more from our youth choir. Um, Happy Easter to you all. As we commemorate the wonderful sacrifice of Jesus Christ, um, I just invite us all to think back upon that hour with me and think back upon that, um, contemplate that as we we spend a moment in prayer, um, asking God to be with us and to fill our time. Kind Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for your goodness and mercy to us. We are grateful that you've brought us to church. We are so thankful, Lord, for what you have done for us. And the the prayer of that song, we pray as well, that you would fall afresh on us. Stay with us, Spirit of the living God. May this sacrifice not become dim in our minds. May the importance of it not fade away on our priority lists, but may today you reawaken in us a desire for you and a thankful heart. In Jesus' holy name, amen. You know, on July 6, 1415, there was a Christian reformer by the name of John Huss who was, born, who was burned at the stake. Now, Huss was a well-known preacher and teacher in Europe, particularly in the Czech Republic, Bohemia at the time, and in Germany. And his teachings ran contrary to the established traditions of the church of that time. And so this tended to get him into trouble. For one thing, Huss believed that all people should be able to read the Bible in their own language. For another thing, Huss spoke up against the religious abuses that were evident among the clergy of that time. Well, the, the emperor and the religious leaders of that time, they did not appreciate the divisiveness that he seemed to bring. Sometimes truth brings divisiveness when some are clinging to error. In 1414, he was given safe conduct to come to Constance, Germany. As some of you know the story from your readings of Great Controversy and other history books, that great, that, that safe conduct, though, was revoked, and Huss was thrown into prison. And he spent upwards to 73 days or so in a a, a prison that was really a sewer. And it was a a horrible place to be. All All of his rights were literally stripped from him. And over the course of about a year, John Huss underwent a number of trials. During the Council of Constance in July of 1415, Huss was finally condemned to die unjustly as a heretic. So as he was brought to the stake, leading up to that moment, he was given a number of final last words to share. And one of the things that John Huss said, one of the last recorded words of John Huss were as follows. He says, in 100 years, God will raise up a man whose calls for reform cannot be suppressed. And wouldn't you know, almost 100 years exactly to that day, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses onto the church of that door in Wittenberg. You see, Huss's dying words had come true. You know, there's something very incredibly significant about someone's last words. That not only goes for John Huss, but that also goes for Jesus Christ. During Jesus' final hours here on earth, as he was hanging upon the cross, he uttered seven final words or phrases that I'd like to analyze and look at with you today because each one of these phrases has a message for us today on this Easter weekend. 
The first statement we'll look at is found in Luke chapter 23, verse 33 to 34. And we'll call it the statement of forgiveness for his enemies. So Luke chapter 23, verse 33 to 34. And starting in verse 33, it says, And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. You know, we might expect and understand had Jesus in that moment been calling down curses from heaven upon those who were taking his life unjustly. Jesus had done absolutely nothing wrong to deserve this pitiful treatment, the death of a criminal. And yet, rather than calling down curses, all we see is Jesus calling upon heaven, upon God, to forgive these people. You know, that word forgive used in the Greek is aphiomi. It means to pardon, to cancel, to release from legal and moral consequences. Interestingly, Jesus is not making a request. He's making a command. He's, he's making a command to forgive these people, for God to forgive these people. You know, it's amazing to me that the Savior of the universe, while he's being crucified, the only thing on his mind is the forgiveness of those who are taking his life. You see, the type of love that God has for us is a love that seeks the good, not the harm or the condemnation of his people. He's actively seeking to redeem and to restore us. Even though we don't deserve Jesus' love, he gives it to us anyways. That's what we learned from that first message. And you know, ironically, this prayer of Jesus to forgive these people who are crucifying him was already being answered because Jesus is God's answer to the prayer of forgiveness for the world. The cross is the physical representation, manifestation of the forgiveness of God. So when you see the symbol of the cross, that is a symbol of Jesus who is the forgiveness. He doesn't just offer, he is the forgiveness. And so place your faith in him today. That is the message of that first word of Jesus. The second statement Jesus makes before he dies and if, is just a few verses later in Luke 23, 42, verse 42 to 43. And I'll call it the statement of salvation to the dying thief. So starting in verse 42, it reads this. Then the thief said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. You know, there's a couple of things we can gain from this. First, even though Jesus was dying, he was not too weak to save this dying thief. You know, Isaiah 59 verse 1 says, The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. What Jesus is showing to all of us by telling this thief that, yes, you will be with me in paradise, even at this man's moments before his death, is that Jesus can save everyone who comes to him without exception. You see, the second lesson we can learn is that salvation is by faith and not by works, because if it were by works, this man would by no means make it into the kingdom, because his entire life until that point led him to death. But here at his dying moment, he gives his heart to Jesus. There is no one too far gone, my friends, to experience that love and forgiveness of Jesus. Place your faith in him today. Don't wait another moment is the message of this. It's like those workers, those, the, the 11th hour workers who were paid just as much as the first early bird workers. Those early bird workers in, the, in that parable of the, the, uh, the workers in the vineyard, Matthew 20, were not, they were not happy that the 11th hour workers got paid just as much as they did. But what that shows us is that there are no degrees of salvation, my friends. Salvation is by faith by grace through faith, and that goes for all of us. So the, the message of Jesus' words to the thief is a message to all of us, and it's simply this, you're never too far gone to give your heart to Jesus. The third thing Jesus says while on the cross is found in John 19, 26 to 27. This is where we find the statement of affection for his mother, verse 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. 
You know, one of the most difficult things for all humans is to think of others before themselves. This is particularly a, a, a challenging moral lesson for our, young, for our children to learn. I remember it being a very difficult lesson for me to learn, thinking of others before myself. You know, the other day, um, we, we bought Abigail an ice cream and we sat down to enjoy it and I was looking out somewhere else and I heard, you know, Abigail was enjoying her ice cream beside me and I heard her say, Daddy! And I expected to look down and to, um, and to have her say, you know, have her completely demolished her ice cream and be handing me the empty container. But instead, I turned and there was a spoon right at my mouth with a, with a blob of ice cream on it. And she said, try some, Daddy. And I said, wow, maybe we're getting somewhere with this whole sharing, thinking of others thing. Um, as humans, it's hard for us to think about others before ourselves. But on the cross, just moments before he breathed his last, Jesus was not thinking about himself, although we would have understood if he was. He was thinking about his mother making sure his mom was taken care of. And I can just imagine his mother wondering, could he really be thinking about me in a time like this? Jesus loves you with a selfless love. That's the message of his third message on the, on the cross. The fourth statement of Jesus is a statement of anguish to God. Matthew 27, 45 to 46 says, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabatane. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, these words probably represent the greatest suffering Jesus endured on the cross. Sure, there's no question about it. Crucifixion inflicted a lot of pain upon him physically. But that is not what caused him the greatest pain. The greatest pain was the sense of separation from God. While in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told his disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Was he being crucified in that moment? No. He was going through intense emotional mental anguish. You know, Ellen White says in Desire of Ages 754, the father was with his son, yet his presence was not revealed. Referring to the darkness surrounding the cross, she said it was a symbol of the agony and the horror that weighed upon his heart. But here's the point of this part, is that Jesus was willing to go through great lengths, my friends, to taste that forever separation just to restore our relationship with Jesus, to restore our relationship with God. And that's a powerful, powerful reality of it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse two says, for the joy before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. The fifth statement is the shortest of them all, found in John 19, 28. I call this his statement of suffering. John 9, verse 28 says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. You know, you can't get more human than that. I mean, we know that Jesus was eternally God in every sense of the term, but he was also human. He experienced wants and needs just like you and I did, and we do. John 1 verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Hebrews 2 verse 17 says, Therefore, in all things, he had to be, ma he, he had to be made like his brothers, that he, may, he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So that message, there's a message, believe it or not, in those simple words, I thirst. It's simply this. Jesus is our merciful and faithful high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses. The sixth statement of Jesus is found in John 19.30. It is his statement of victory. Let's read it together. John 19.30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and it says he gave up his spirit. You know, it might seem like Jesus is there giving up to despair, to defeat, to those looking on, it was as if Jesus had given up completely and, you know, he died early. But if you look at just two verses back, it says, Jesus, knowing all things had now been accomplished, says, it is finished. His words, it is finished, simply declare that the victory had been won. Jesus has defeated sin and death. Jesus' work of salvation is complete and there's nothing more that we can add to it by our good works. 
Jesus could have given up. He could have brought a legion of angels to rescue him, but he went through with the plan of salvation all the way to its bitter end, and he says, it is finished. And so that, that sixth uh, word of Jesus teaches us that Jesus accomplished what he came here to do. The work of salvation is complete in him, and we are to place our faith in him. The seventh and the final statement of Jesus before his death is his statement of commitment to his Father. Verse 46 of Luke chapter 23 says, And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. You know, in these final words of Jesus before his death, we can see his complete and his utter trust in God. I love this quote. Jesus entered death in the same way he lived each day of his life, offering up his life as the perfect sacrifice and placing himself in God's hands. What an amazing way to live. If we live our lives in this way, whether we face death imminently or not, we can have that sort of peace of submission to God that God is in control and that we give our lives into his hands and there's great peace involved with that sort of mindset. So Jesus submitted to God until the very end. He was submissive to God's will. And I praise the Lord that he was because if he wasn't, we wouldn't have any hope at all. You see, Jesus lived his life for God. He died for God. And as a result, Jesus is now in heaven preparing a place for each and every one of us And I pray we will accept that free gift of eternal life that he offers each and every one of us. Won't you accept that today? So here you have it, the seven last words of Jesus, and here are the seven lessons we learn from it. Even though we don't deserve his love, Jesus gives it to us anyways. Number two, you're never too far gone to give your heart to Jesus. Number three, Jesus loves you with a selfless love. He gave of himself to give you everything. Number four, Jesus was willing to go through great lengths to taste forever separation to restore our relationship to God. Number five, Jesus is our merciful and faithful high priest and sympathizes with our weaknesses. Number six, Jesus accomplished what he came here to do. Number seven, Jesus was submitted to God until the very end. You know, there's a common thread throughout the lessons we learned from these last seven statements. And what is that common thread? Good news. I mean, even... In his dying words, Jesus was whispering to all of humanity, good news. You might wonder, well, what's good about the death of Jesus? I mean, didn't his death mean his defeat? Not exactly. And I praise the Lord for that. Although it may have appeared like a defeat at first, if it wasn't for the death of Jesus, there wouldn't be the resurrection of Jesus. Just as a seed must be buried and lie dormant in the ground before it sprouts up into new life, so Jesus had to die pardon me, and be buried in a tomb in order to rise again with new life for all people. So even in his dying words, Jesus is there whispering good news to humanity, my friends. It's almost like he's saying, don't worry, guys. Death doesn't have the final word. This death I'm about to die means victory for all who believe. The good news about Easter is that Jesus didn't remain in the grave. You can't find his tomb today. Why? Because it's not there. He's not there. And now he offers that victory to all of us who give our hearts to him. So my basic invitation to you as I close is the same invitation Jesus makes in these seven last words spoken from the cross. It's never too late to give your heart to Jesus, so won't you do it now? And I invite you guys to be receptive to what the Holy Spirit is teaching upon your heart, inviting you to do as we listen to our youth choir once again. May God bless you.
Wow, thank you. thank you guys so much. Let's just bow our heads as we close with prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much. This has just been a real joy to be here, to, to listen to the sound of these amazing voices uplifting your name. Thank you for our young people in this church. Thank you so much for dying on the cross so, you could, so we could have a second chance, a chance to live with you forever, and we all together accept what you've done on the cross for us. Lord, you have you are risen to set the captives free, to ransom you and me, to bind up the brokenhearted, risen to bring us home again. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much. In Jesus' holy name, amen.